Bennett, if I may start with you, um, you've you've made your name as you know a very distinctive director, and you know dealing with rather complex complex characters, um, Truman Capote, of course, Billy Bean, and Moneyball, and notably here, I suppose, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Dupont. Um, how, how did you first come across this story? I mean, th this is an extraordinary story, but I think most of us on, on this side of the water don't really know much about it. Did you? I, I had never heard about the story until a stranger approached me in a store and uh, had an envelope um, with newspaper <clears throat> clippings in it and said, I think that you're going to want to make a film about this story. And I think, most I think most people in America are unfamiliar with it or only vaguely familiar with it. It's a strange thing, isn't it? You know, a multimillionaire kills wrestling champ. I mean, it would seem to me that was sort of tabloid heaven, you know, all around the world in some ways. Yeah. It's, it's a little mysterious that it <clears throat> wasn't a bigger story. I mean, it was, it was a hot story for a moment but there was not a lot of um, deep coverage of it. It, w it went away pretty quickly. So you were intrigued by the story. You ran with it. You developed it. Obviously, financing came along at some yeah. point. So you spent how long in <coughs> getting to the stage where you were ready to think well, about was, shooting a film? It was... Um, it, I learned about the story eight years ago and um, committed to doing it immediately. I just was very attracted to um, the bizarreness of it um, and the, the themes that seem to be running underneath it. You know, I'm, I think I'm attracted to these characters who um, are, are outsiders, people who end up in worlds where they don't really belong. And um, I think all my films have, have that kind of theme, uh, this, these bizarre ambitions by protagonists who I believe that if they can accomplish you know, their, their ambition that they'll somehow remedy the damages of their life or something. And um, you know, I researched it and flew around and met everybody and um, it took a couple of years to get a script to the place where we could begin getting practical with it. And um, at that point, it w began a, a two-year effort that would end in failure of trying to you know, find the support for it, uh, in which time I um, you know, conceded that it was not possible and put it down. and found something else to be passionate about, which was Moneyball. But as soon as Moneyball was winding down, I uh, picked it up again and started searching for support. And uh, by that time, Megan Ellison had begun uh, producing films. And I, I can pretty confidently say, had it not been for her, the, the film could not have been made. OK. Let me, let me bring Steve in here. Steve, you've. The world knows you've made your name primarily with comic roles, although those of us who are fans of Little Miss Sunshine would say your performance in that suggests there are many other strings to your bow. I think you've proved it beyond doubt here. But were you surprised? Were you surprised to be, uh, to be offered this role, which you know, on the face of it looks like a, a huge departure for you? Um, yeah, I was surprised. I was surprised to have been asked to meet with Bennett. <clears throat> um, apparently my agent was the one who uh, initially threw my name into the hat. And I, I wasn't actively pursuing this movie or, or any movie like it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I was, uh, I was sent the script, I read it, Bennett and I met, and, uh, and then I was offered the part. But yeah, I... I I was surprised because it wasn't necessarily anything that was on my radar at the time. Bennett, let me ask you, what was your thinking in, in casting Steve as uh, DuPont? Um, 
you know, what, what happens when a film is trying to get made is that every agent in town knows that a film is casting and, and lots of names begin to accumulate on lists and get sent along. And so there, there were dozens and dozens of names. And I think Steve's name entered the list later. Uh, but if, if the role is for a character who's between the ages of you know, 47 and 67 and a million other things, oh, I've got clients like that. Uh, that's not to say that uh, Steve's agent wasn't, you know, savvy about it, but um, it is to say that there were lots of names, and I'd considered lots of names, and when Steve's name cropped up, uh, I, I was awfully familiar with what I did not want, um, and he immediately passed through, you know, the original criteria, and, and all the other names began to move away. Um, but what it was about Steve, other than the fact that I think he's a great actor uh, and, and mesmerizing to watch and very particular, um, is that everything I learned about DuPont um, suggested that people underestimated um, what was inside of him. and. I think because of the opportunities that Steve had had as an actor, uh, that uh, opinions had formed about, you know, what to expect. And as Steve put it, when we early on when we began talking, uh, Steve said, you know, I've only ever played characters with mushy centers, <laughs> and. Um, and, and DuPont does not have a mushy center. He seems to have a mushy center, but in fact, there's something very sharp uh, and dangerous inside there. And I, I like the idea that um, the casting would facilitate a, a similar feeling uh, towards the character that people had towards DuPont, which is some kind of belief that uh, the situation is benign. You know, it's, it's awkward, it's weird, it's, maybe it's creepy, um, but ultimately not dangerous. And um, it, uh, allow you to justify what you're seeing um, and why people stayed on the farm as, as things ratcheted up. Mm. And, uh, as Steve very eloquently put it last week, um, when the murder happens, it's something that sh should be shocking, but ultimately not surprising. S Steve, can I uh, can I just ask you? I mean, did you did you get a chance to see I don't know video footage of Dupont or anything like that to capture his essence? I mean, there's something that, that that's very striking about the man, the way he talks, for instance. He, it, it seems very distant. I mean, it's as, almost as though his sentences float away into nothingness. Almost as though he's not in the room. I mean, did did he really did he really speak in that in that manner? <clears throat> he did have a very specific way of talking and a, and a specific demeanor, um, and he had a specific look as well. I think just his physicality was very off-putting to many people. Um, I there there was footage of him. He had commissioned a documentary on himself and uh, one of a, a couple actually and um, the most interesting footage there was the the raw footage <clears throat> that people don't that he didn't want people to see because that showed a side of him that was not his public persona not the persona that he wanted to project at all and there was as Ben had said there there was a sharper edge to that guy and a less tolerant person, and a uh, a more abrasive, more volatile person, and you could just see little hints of it here and there. But the way he spoke to the documentarian, and the way he spoke to the camera crew, and the way he went through in his head what he wanted to say, um, and how he planned out how he wanted, he had a very specific idea of of how he wanted people to perceive him. 
And, and to get a little glimpse of that was helpful. And, and also, the, just there was footage on him and, uh, and how he moved and how he spoke. He did have a very halting way of, of talking, and, um, and I think that served to kind of draw people in in a, a certain way. And, and he would force people to wait until he finished. 